Hey everybody, it's Andrew, and in this episode of Engines of Pure Marquette, we're going to be discussing the Mikados. These are some of the most interesting Pure Marquette steam locomotives, and among the most exciting to talk about. So without further ado, let's get started. In the 1910s, the 282 Mikado was one of the most popular freight locomotives in America. It was an enlargement of the 280 consolidation with a larger and wider firebox that sat over the trailing truck. Early in that same decade, the Pure Marquette Railroad had earned the nickname of Poor Marquette as it was struggling physically and financially with its physical plant in poor condition, but was determined to get itself out of it by acquiring bigger and newer locomotives. Those included the first 10 Pacifics and final batch of consolidations by 1912. In that same year, the Pier Marquette was in its second receivership and the receivers began a program to upgrade the railroad and stake its future development. Part of this plan included new, larger locomotives than what the PM already had. The answer to this was in the form of new Mikados for the Pier Marquette. In 1913, the Pier Marquette ordered 10 Mikados from Baldwin Locomotive Works. They were given the designation MK and numbered 1001 to 1010. The MKs were 75 feet, 1 and 16 inches long overall, and weighed 221 and a half tons total. They had 54,600 pounds of tractive effort, 14 ton, 8,000 gallon tenders, a grade area of 70 square feet, a combined heating surface of 5,393 square feet, 63 inch driving wheels, piston valves with Walshirt's valve gear, 185 psi boilers, and 27 by 30 inch cylinders. All but one of the MKs had siphons fitted in 1936, and some received DuPont BK or Duplex D stokers during their careers. With these specs in mind, the MKs were now the new largest and most powerful locomotives on the Pier Marquette, far outperforming the older C, C1, and C2 consolidations, and even the newest consolidations, the 900s, by 4,000 more pounds of tractive effort. This resulted in the MKs and latter PM Mikados to display some of the 600 and 900 class locomotives and heavy freight service on the Chicago to Detroit main line, and proving themselves to be effective at improving the Pier Marquette's traffic posture. They could handle over 3,100 tons out of Chicago, and over 1,400 tons over New Richmond Hill's 1.4% grade unassisted, 200 more tons than even the SC class or 900s. The unique feature of the MKs were their unusually massive headlights that other railroads locomotives of this decade were better known for. The MKs were the only Pure Marquette locomotives to have such a headlight, but they later had it replaced with the PM's more traditional Pyle National Style headlights that you'd find on a lot of other American locomotives. During World War I, the United States Railroad Administration was created with the intention of running any seized railroads for the government. Among their acts was to create standardized locomotive designs. These included Pacifics, Mikados, and Santa Fe's, of which in two different model types known as heavy and light. The USRA light Mikado was one of, if not the most well-known, of these designs. In the USRA's brief reign until 1920, a considerable amount of these Mikados had been built, and by 1929, when the last was built, 698 original and 641 copies of the light Mikado design were built for over 50 railroads, including the Wabash, Indiana Harbor Belt, and New York Central. The Pure Marquette didn't buy any USRA light Mikados from any manufacturer during World War I, but its traffic volume eventually merited a reconstruction. In response to this, 30 USRA light Mikados from the previously mentioned Indiana Harbor Belt, Wabash, and New York Central were diverted to the Pier Marquette in 1920, renumbered to 1011 through 1040, and redesignated as MK1s in the process. Since they were the same design as one another, they were all identical despite being built by different manufacturers in varying years. Engines 1011 to 1024 used to be 14 Indiana Harbor Belt H6As built by Lima in 1919. 1025 to 1029 were originally five Wabash K2s built by Alco in 1918, and 1030 to 1040 were 11 New York Central 5100 series H6As built by Alco in 1918. Regarding technical specifications, the MK meant Mikado, and the 1 denoted the model. Each MK1 was 81 feet long overall, 14 feet 11 inches tall, and weighed 238 tons total. Width is unknown to me. They had a great area of 66.7 square feet, combined heating surface of 5,100 square feet, 63-inch driving wheels, piston valves with Walshirt's valve gear, a duplex D1 stoker, 26 by 30-inch cylinders, 200 psi boilers, 
and 54,600 pounds of tractive effort. When first built, the MK1s were given tenders with a fuel capacity of 10,000 gallons of water and 16 tons of coal. They were originally assigned work on the Chicago to Detroit main line as the Pierre Marquette began retiring its older and smaller freight locomotives. In the 1920s, most U.S. railroads, including the Pier Marquette, saw an increase in total freight tonnage hauled each year, from 14.8 million tons in 1920 to 19.7 million in 1927. As businesses increased in number during the decade, emphasis also started shifting to the rising automobile industry centered in a lot of Michigan cities that served the Pier Marquette. In response to this, the Pier Marquette designed the MK2s, of which they asked Alco to build 10 of such numbered 1041 to 1050 in 1927. These locomotives, along with the MKs, were the only Pier Marquette-owned Mikados that were built directly for the Pier Marquette, compared to the MK1s and later MK6s being bought secondhand from other railroads. The design of the MK2 was essentially a modified version of the USRA light Mikado featuring Pier Marquette-style modifications. The MK2s had the same drive wheel diameter, boiler pressure, cylinder size, valves, overall length, and original tenders as the MK1s. The first five MK2s also had duplex D1 stokers like the MK1s, while the rest had DuPont B stokers. But the MK2s were a bit heavier at 250 tons total, had 0.1 more square feet of grade area, and 200 more pounds of tractive effort than the MK1s. What all the MK2s had that the previous PM mics didn't have were a feed water heater, more familiar Baker valve gear, and a booster engine, making these the first Pier Marquette locomotives to have a feed water heater and a booster. When the booster was engaged, it increased the locomotive's tractive effort by 10,000 pounds. Add that to their 54,800 pounds without the booster, and they had a combined tractive effort of 64,800 pounds when the booster was engaged. The MK2s and some of the PM's N2 Berkshires were the only locomotives on the railroad to have boosters. The feed water heater on the MK2s was a Worthington 3B. The Berkshires would use a later model known as the 5S and 5SSA. The MK2s had one final innovation, that being thermosiphons in their fireboxes, which the MK1s later received. As traffic was peaking out in 1929, the Pier Marquette bought five more Mikados from the Erie Railroad. These in question were of the Erie's N1 class built from 1911 to 1913. The ex-Erie N1s were reclassed to MK6 and renumbered to 1095 through 1099. 1096 was an Alco product, while the rest were built by Baldwin. Despite their age, the now MK6s were still very good Mikados at their new home. The locomotives were 77.5 feet long and weighed 254 tons total. They had a tractive effort of 60,900 pounds, a grade area of 70 square feet, a combined heating surface of 5,381 square feet, 63-inch driving wheels, 28 by 32-inch cylinders, 180 PSI boilers, piston valves with Baker valve gear, a Worthington BL feed water heater, and a DuPont B stoker. They did not have a booster. When first built, the MK6s had Vanderbilt tenders and were the only Pier Marquette locomotives to have them. But they were very small with a fuel capacity of only 9,000 gallons of water and 16 tons of coal. The Pier Marquette eventually re-equipped the MK6s with larger tenders in 1937. 1096 was fitted with the tender from an MK as seen in this photo. The rest were re-equipped with 10,000 gallon triangular tenders, and some were later re-equipped again with 22,000 gallon tenders, which the Berkshires also had. Like most railroads, the Pier Marquette used their Mikados to pull fast and heavy freight trains, and in their case, mostly in the state of Michigan. The MK2s were placed in service on the Billy Saginaw Ludington line where their boosters could be used effectively on heavy trains to and from the Port Lake at Ludington. They could be seen all over the Pier Marquette rail network as well. Although the MK1, 2, and 6 Mikados had already been dethroned as the railroad's most powerful locomotives before their arrivals by the SF Class Santa Fe's, the Mikados were more versatile as the SFs were very slow therefore unsuitable for fast freights and better suited to slow, heavy freight drags. The Mikados, on the other hand, were just as good at pulling heavy freights as they were at pulling fast freights, albeit not as heavy compared to the SFs. Later on in their careers, the MK1s and 2s were fitted with flying number boards on the front that flanked the bell, which a lot of Vance Werrigan Berkshires also had. The MK6s as well had those number boards fitted, 
albeit the bell wasn't moved to the front, which did make it look a bit odd. The MK1s and MK2s were also re-equipped with 19RA tenders from Alco in 1930, while the old tenders of the MK1s were given to the older MKs and some of the smaller Pacifics. Speaking of the 1930s, by that time, the Class MKs were reassigned to branch lines as the Great Depression finished off the last of the Pier Marquette's older locomotives they replaced on those lines, minus three moguls. Also during that decade, as businesses began to recover, some MK1s and 2s were transferred to the Canadian Division and had grab irons fitted to their tenders to comply with Canadian law. Some of these on the Canadian Division also had water scoops installed for use on the Michigan Central Main Lines with track pants. The Pure Marquette also found their Mikados to be quite good at pulling heavy passenger trains that were too heavy for the smaller Pacifics unassisted, and during the Second World War, the Mikados could sometimes be seen pulling heavy resort specials between Chicago, Illinois and Petoskey, Michigan. They were the Pure Marquette's largest and best all-around locomotives until the arrival of the N-Class Berkshires in 1937. Then in the 1940s, the Mikados had their air compressors moved to the pilot for presumably easier maintenance. It also gave them a more typical Pure Marquette look that future PM locomotives would be built with. The Pure Marquette began retiring the old battered MKs in 1944. Scrapping commenced on them in 1946, a year before the railroad became part of the Chesapeake and Ohio in 1947, and the MKs were all cut up by 1948. The remaining XPM Mikados continued their commercial service with the Chesapeake and Ohio, who also found a questionable way to tell each apart by the new numbers they gave them. The MK1s, for some reason, entered the roster as K8s and were renumbered to 2350 through 2379, the MK2s were reclassed to K5s and renumbered to 1060 through 1069, and the MK6s were redesignated as K6s and renumbered to 1070 through 1074. In their days on the Chesapeake and Ohio, the ex Pure Marquette Mikados could be seen working alone or double-heading with a fellow classmate or other ex Pure Marquette locomotives in the state of Michigan and other states the CNO spanned. When the Chesapeake and Ohio began dieselizing, the former MK6s were the first to go, as their low weight made them useless in the Chesapeake district after diesels took over it, and they were all cut up in July 1949. The XMK-1 served with the Chesapeake and Ohio until 1951 when the railroad's former Pier Marquette district was fully dieselized. Locomotive 2376, formerly Pier Marquette 1037 slash New York Central 5113, was sold to the Sydney and Lewisburg Railway in the Canadian province of Nova Scotia, renumbered to 102 and fitted with a narrower coal bunker. The rest of the MK-1s were scrapped in 1951. All of the MK2s suffered the same fate the following year. As for the 1037, now SNL 102, it served the rest of its career with the Sydney and Lewisburg until 1961, despite having served longer than her falling siblings and being the last New York Central Pier Marquette Mikado left in existence, the Sydney and Lewisburg tragically scrapped the locomotive later that year. Even the MK1s and MK6s non-purchased sister locomotives serving the Wabash, Indiana Harbelt, New York Central, and Erie were all scrapped by the end of the 1950s. Luckily, nine USRA light Mikados are still around in preservation, and since the most well-known PM Mikes, the MK1s and MK2s were USRA light Mikados, or based off of the USRA light Mikado, their legacy and lineage isn't totally gone. These Mikados are one of, if not the most well-known extinct Pier Marquette steam locomotives. While it's definitely a massive shame that none of them were preserved, the Mikados had a unique and diverse heritage in the fleet, worked well alongside their bigger brothers, paved the way into the future for the railroad's growth, and with the pride of fast freight service before the Berkshires. And they will always be remembered in the history book of the Pier Marquette Railroad. The railroad that gave us 1225, the real Polar Express. If you enjoyed the video or learned something new, subscribe to my channel and activate notifications so that you won't miss a future upload, including the next episode where I will be talking about the Santa Fe types. More information on the future of this playlist will be given out in future episodes. I'm Andrew Real of Bammers, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.